So if we think about male competition, this intrasexual selection for males, there are a number of different ways to divide this up. We'll do this following division where we'll think about types of male competition in terms of contests, territories, and then sperm competition, and then within sperm competition we'll look at strategies involving producing more sperm, preventing additional sperm, removing previous sperm, sabotaging other males, and in fact you can envision from the right perspective removing previous offspring as a form of this sperm competition distinct from territories and contests. So for male competition when we're looking at contests, so this is males compete with one another for social status, and then the females mate with the higher social status males, so males competing with each other by fighting with antlers, for example like this, or this is a type of pig where in fact these canine teeth have grown up out of the upper jaw to create they're not horns, they're teeth, right? But they use these to fight with one another in a similar manner as these guys. And we actually saw an earlier example of this when we thought about giraffes, where these males are fighting with one another for social dominance, and that provides them with the ability to displace lower ranked males, and provides them with the ability to assess the fertility status of the female. We can think of these contests as male-male competition, and the winner gets the female, which is the traditional way of thinking about it. But as with much of this sexual selection field, you can also think about it from another perspective, which is females, by mating with the higher social status males, they are preferentially mating with the males that can win fights. The males that are the largest, probably the males with the best genes for their offspring. So although we can think about contests and male competition from one point of view, these also benefit the females by showing them which males may well be the ones with the highest quality. So as we go through all these sexual selection topics, although we're often phrasing them as being either male competition or female choice, often in reality things are more complicated and more of a mix of the two. Another form of competition, uh, here's an example of a bird called the satin bower bird, so that's these guys here. And what these birds do, the males, they build these bowers, so these structures here, you can see that we're, um, it's kind of a wall here, and then they dance at these structures. So these things here, these are not nests, right? The eggs are not going to go into here. This is purely a stage that the male has done to show off his own dancing skills. And he's also decorated it with blue things. So these males spend a lot of time flying around finding blue things and bringing them back. And so then the, the males create this bower, and so then what happens is, while the males are away, females will actually come as a group and they'll tour the bowers, right? All these bowers are near each other. The females will walk along, check them all out, and then they'll go away. Then the females will come back to the bowers that they judge to be the best, um, often based on the number of blue things. And the males will be there, and then the males will do their dance, and they'll perform. And so the female will watch several different males do his performance at the bower. Then the females go away and they make the nests. And then the females come back, and they visit a smaller number of males that they have judged to be the best in terms of bowers and dancing. And then they'll choose one of those males to mate with, and then they'll receive genetic material from the male, and then go back to their nest and lay the eggs in the nest. And you can either think of this as females choosing. Another way of thinking about this, or the way we're thinking about it in this context, is the males are all competing with each other, right? The males have to make bowers that are better than the other males. The males have to collect more blue things than the other males. The males have to do a better dance than the other males. And there's actually a, a paper I've given the citation for here that shows that when females are young, they're often actually intimidated by these big displays, um, the dancing of the males. And actually, for young females, all they do is just count the number of blue things. And they don't worry about the dancing abilities of these males. Whereas older females who are perhaps wised up and aren't quite as materialistic and just focused on the number of blue things, they'll actually look at aspects of the personality of the bird too. That's a way of anthropomorphizing this. You can actually see a little bit of progression where the younger females are using some of the information, the older females are using all of the information, and this is important for these males who are competing with one another. Our second form of male competition we'll look at is territories. So the way that this works is that males control territories, and in those territories are females who will then mate with that male that controls the territory. So there's an area, the male controls it, any females inside there mate with that male and not with other males. There are many examples of this. One interesting example comes from red-winged blackbirds, that's these guys here. They have little red epaulets that's on the top of their wing. 
And it turns out that when you actually go out and look at these guys and the territories that they maintain, because the males are competing with each other to run these territories, the success, it turns out, is largely determined by the size of this red opalette. And they've actually done experiments, so here's actually some results from an interesting experiment where they grabbed males from their territories and then took them and used a Sharpie marker to color in the red opalette, and then they put them back in their territory. And then they measured, okay, if you grab a male and Sharpie in his epaulette so it becomes black, versus you grab a male and as a control, then you re-release him without coloring in his epaulette. Same sorts of males, the same kind of handling treatment. If the epaulette is made to disappear, then the number of trespasses, this is the number of times other males try to invade their territory or maybe try to fly in to mate with their females, that goes way up. So the male is the same, but if he just doesn't have the same sized red epaulette, he basically gets disrespected in a sense six times as much as he would if he had the regular epaulette. And the size of epaulettes therefore is important, and so males actually perceive this as a, a threat and they judge other males based on this. This is an experiment where what they did was they took and they made model red-winged blackbirds with different sized epaulettes, and they put these models right on the edge of a territory. So this is simulating a, another male that might represent a threat, right? Because he's on the edge of the territory, maybe he'll try to take over. And when the mount had the normal sized epaulette, then the male whose territory it was next to would attack it, say, four times every 10 minutes. If they made a fake bird that had a double sized epaulette, then the male whose territory it's near would actually attack it almost twice as much. But if it was given a smaller epaulette or no epaulette at all, then the male whose territory it was near didn't attack it nearly as much, presumably because it didn't perceive it as much of a threat. Species, they maintain territories, but it turns out a lot of the maintenance of this territory and the competition that's going on is actually driven by this physical feature, um, which can actually be somewhat beneficial to the organism, because it means they actually don't really fight with each other as much as check each other's red epaulettes out. Um, and sometimes when we find examples from nature, it turns out that there are other species um, including humans, that sometimes act in a similar manner. So here's an example in humans. This is a really interesting study. This was done based on data from the Olympics in 2004. The way the Olympics works is there's four different sports which are direct one-on-one -on -one fights and competitions with each other. Uh, these events are boxing, taekwondo, Greco-Roman wrestling, and freestyle wrestling. And when individuals enter into these contests, they are randomly assigned either blue uniforms or red uniforms, and then they fight each other. And it turns out that when these researchers looked at data from the Olympics in 2004, the color that the individuals were assigned showed a significant difference, right? So when an individual got a red uniform, they won 55% of the time. When an individual was assigned a blue uniform, they only won 45% of the time, right? So it's like this, where the red wins and the blue loses. Sometimes that happened, but more often you get cases like this. And this is statistically significant across all these sports. And again, this red and blue color assignment is actually random. And they actually went into more detail and they looked at the types of fights that are either very, very big mismatches. So, right, this is a boxing match with like a knockout in the first round. So a large degree of asymmetry in the skill. One person is way better than the other. All the way to the other quarter of matches where they were very evenly matched, right? So it went down to a split decision in the final, you know, after all the rounds were fought. Or with Taekwondo, they scored points back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with a number of tiebreakers before someone finally won. When you had matches where the opponents were heavily mismatched, then it didn't really matter if they were wearing red or blue. And in fact, blue did a little bit better, but that's not a significant difference. But when they looked at the 25% of the matches that were the closest matches, in that case, the individuals randomly assigned the red uniform actually won their matches two-thirds of the time versus their opponents who only won one-third of the time. And that's actually kind of amazing, right? There's something about this color red that's leading to these individuals who have spent their whole life training for a competition, for a fight against other opponents, and perhaps the most important single factor, if they're evenly matched, is the random color they get, where wearing red causes these individuals to win, these individuals to lose, and it's 
perhaps no coincidence that that red is the same as those epaulettes from the Red Wing Blackbirds. There seems to be something really interesting about the color red and how um, that matches with competitive ability. So if we go back to thinking about um, territories, what if some males can't compete, right? For example, if all the space is taken up by males who have already staked out territories and the males that remain are kind of small and wimpy or they can't quite fight for those territories or maybe they have small red epaulettes, what if those males can't compete? In many cases where males compete for females or control territories, it turns out other males will sneak in to mate. And those are called sneaker males. So if you read in your book, your book actually describes this process in iguanas, which is also told in this really fascinating book here, this book, uh, Dr. Tatiana's Sex Advice to All Creation. It's written kind of like an advice column, but it covers a bunch of sexual selection topics. And in this book, one of the letters that an organism has written in for her to answer is by a female iguana. And the female iguana is talking about how she likes to sun herself on the rocks, and she's hanging out, and like everything's okay. And, but then she looks over and there's like a group of males kind of watching her and they're kind of, they're looking at her and she kind of, she knows what they're thinking about, right? Because they're males and they're looking at her. And then she actually sees that they're like rubbing themselves up against rock, sort of disturbing way. So she writes a letter kind of asking like, what's going on? And the truth is, and your book I believe explains it, and this certainly does, that what happens is in iguanas, large males stake out territories. Smaller males can't get territories. But what they'll do is they'll run into a territory and they'll mate with the females as fast as they can before they get chased out. So of course mating actually takes a little bit of time. So what these males will actually do is they'll rub themselves up against rocks to kind of get themselves halfway there, get themselves right ready to go so that they can make the best use of their time um, when they run in. Stinker males aren't just in iguanas. Uh, we see this in bluegill sunfish as well. In fact here in sunfish males stake out territories and when a female lays eggs in their territory the male then deposits sperm on top of those eggs. So there are actually two different types of males. There are satellite males. So these are males that, in fact, have female coloration and will slowly swim into a territory looking like a female, kind of acting like a female. They'll swim over to the eggs that a female had deposited, and then they'll release their sperm and then swim away quite quickly because at that point they're kind of found out by the territorial males. And then there are sneaker males, more like these iguanas, where they'll kind of swim in as fast as they can deposit sperm on those eggs, and then swim away as fast as they can before they get attacked. So when males can't compete, sometimes they have these alternate strategies. And in some cases, females may even aid those other males due to this idea of bet hedging. So bet hedging is the idea that you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. If a female is in a territory of a male, and all of her mating is going to be with that male, he's probably a pretty good bet, right? Because he is a sort of male who can maintain a territory. But there's no guarantee he's the best. And so it might be selectively advantageous for females to sometimes mate with other males as well. So maybe do most of their mating with a territorial male, but occasionally aid sneaker males, maybe by hanging out on the edge of the territory, for example. Um, and this is seen, for example, in gorillas. In gorillas, there's a male with a small group of females that travel with him. And when the females go into estrus, they mate with that male. It is sometimes noticed that females will sneak away from the social group and go behind a bush and meet up with another male who, not big enough to have his own harem yet, but is kind of following at a safe distance. There's kind of this interesting anecdotal data in humans that when females are at their fertile point of their fertility cycle, that's when human females have more sexually explicit daydreams, and which might make them more prone to reproductive events outside of the relationship that they're in. And then there are a number of situations where we see in birds where the eggs in a nest are mostly from the male that's cooperatively raising the young with the female. But some of them have parentage from other males that this female bird has flown off and mated with and then come back to the nest with. So we see even in situations where males have territories or have partnered up, females are sometimes selected to hedge their bets and engage in extra matings beyond that male who is maintaining the territory.